All right, gang, welcome to blog number 32. It's been a couple of years since the last blog. That shouldn't be too surprising, I don't think, because it has also been the COVID era. And uh, I was just doing a lot of things that were very boring, right? So in the spirit of the blog being about big milestones, specifically in my drum career, things worth reporting, you know, milestones along that path to wherever I'm going. Um, COVID era was rotten, just not the time for it. I actually went back to school for three years during that time to get an undergraduate degree in psychology. Um, that uh, I thought about making a blog about, but wow, it would be the most boring blog ever. It was three years of sitting, studying, reading, taking the train up to school, being in class, reading more, typing, studying. So I'm going to include some notes on that at the end of the blog, but uh, it's just not super relevant to what we're doing here, although it was very rewarding as a, as a person. So it's, it's worth talking about just a little bit. Um, so we're going to do sort of a weird leapfrog form with this. That's what we're going to talk about at the end. Also, this blog I feel like needs to represent um, not only the Student Summit, which is the main point of it, but this year on the website. So in March of this year, 2022, I launched a totally new, majorly updated and improved version of my website and I changed the name to jpbouvetmethod.com. It used to be jpbouvetmusic. Um, and that was huge. So that was and is uh, a major milestone in my drumming career. When I look back the last many years, um, this is a really big moment. The launch of that site was a really big moment. And I want to talk about the site and why, but again, uh, we're going to scoot that down before school, after the student summit. We'll talk about that a little bit because I really don't want this blog to feel like a sales pitch for the website. Um, the point of this blog, the big deal uh, that, that just happened that is really exciting for me and is definitely a milestone, was the 2022 J.P. Bouvet Method Student Summit. And this was the inaugural event. Uh, and it's something I plan on doing every year. But this was basically, the Student Summit is an end of the year event where we celebrate as much as possible the students and celebrate all of the things that we've studied for the year, all the progress we've made, the freedom uh, and the vocabulary that we have developed on the website, um, the persistence, the struggles, the victories, and the relationships that have been built. Right? One of the things I'll talk about later uh, is that the new website allows me to really get to know students and they're playing really well through video exchanges. Um, so I'm feeling closer and less anonymous with my students on the website than I ever have. And that is way more effective in terms of them getting better. And it's really rewarding and fulfilling for me as a teacher to not be just sort of making lessons and putting them out into the ethers and seeing if someone emails me about them. So that's been a big change. But anyways, we'll talk about the website a little more because again, big deal for me and it will continue to be a big part of my drum life. But let's, let's jump into the Student Summit. So the end of the year event, it was an absolute blast. Uh, I wanna, don't want the bulk of this blog to be basically just a recap of how it went and what was going on. And I have, I have some clips that I'll pull from it as I talk about stuff or after I kind of summarize stuff. Um, but it was, it was really fun. You know, I, I, it, was, it, was, it was rewarding for a few reasons. Um, one of those reasons was that it was the first time that I have seen that many of my students in one place. I forgot to look specifically, you know, I don't know exactly the numbers, but I think around 60 people. I know I saw 56 at some point. I think around 60 students were all in the room at the same time. And for me, this was really special. I hadn't actually thought about this beforehand, how moving that would be. But when the event started going and people actually showed up for it, it was a digital event, live stream to Zoom, but we're all pretty used to Zoom and those types of things now, so it, it feels a little bit like you're hanging out. To have that many students in the same room was really moving, and that many that almost all I have gotten to know to some degree and know they're playing and know what they've been working on and their struggles and their victories for the year. Um, to see everyone coming together with such positive energy and sharing where they're from in the chat and, and throwing questions out for the guest speakers and everything, was really was really special, um, and that that was that was a real highlight of my whole teaching career so far. Um, so that was special. It's also special that we all in the last you know two or three years 
my teaching philosophy has really started to click and solidify and deepen. And I'm sort of carving out a niche as, a, as someone who teaches th creativity and improvisation, but actually with like step-by-step -step approaches, not sort of vague, useless concepts. Um, so students have been finding a ton of freedom on the drum set, but we also have developed a vocabulary for within the curriculum that is really exclusive to what we do on the site. Um, and a lot of this terminology, no one would understand if they weren't a member of the site, right? Things like, oh, I've been, you know, you know, using the 16 invisible rhythms with this swanky half swung groove, and it's really expanding my rhythmic vocabulary while I'm in flow mode, and that's really dope. So you can say stuff like that, and everyone on the site understands what you're talking about in great detail because it's referring to like specific patterns, specific concepts, specific goals that we all know and acknowledge. Um, so it's really cool. It just like, it becomes deeper and deeper and more cool and more special to have uh, those students all in the same place, um, and just yeah, see this really this this real community start to bud in a way that hasn't been possible on the site before. So that was really special. Um, if I talk through the event a bit, and uh, I'll just you know throw some highlights out, and then we'll uh, I'll I'll plug in some clips from the actual event so you can see kind of like what it was like. So the first thing. Student awards. It was really great to, to reward some students with some, some real, some, some physical rewards um, for their hard work for the year. And I try really hard to make the rewards actually cool, right? Again, I know people's playing, so I chose symbols for people to win that I actually think would go well with their symbol setup and complement their playing. But gave away uh, uh, 14 by 6.5 nickel over brass um, snare drum, 19-inch uh, polyphonic crash, uh, 18 inch Byzance medium thin jazz crash, one of my favorite crashes personally. And then bricks of sticks and the first ever uh, an exclusive print uh, t shirts uh, for, for the website. Um, and people won them in the States, also in the UK, and one of those people is in Vietnam as well. Um, which again, just really cool to see the global community coming together little by little. So, student awards, that was fun. And then we had two guest speakers come. And this was a real highlight, and they were amazing. So the first guest speaker was Gabriel Harris. Gabriel works at Minel Symbols, and he has an important say in the design of the actual symbols. Right? Pretty much every symbol passes through Gabriel's hands. And he is uh, sort of, uh, uh, he's an expert on how physically manipulating a symbol affects the resulting sound. So he gave us a talk on, and I'm going to really, uh, you know, display my bad memory here, but many of the physical attributes of a symbol, including the, the weight, the thickness, the size, the bell size and whether or not there's a bell, different types of lathing, different um, types of raw materials that go into it, uh, like different um, alloys, and what else, different types of hammering, or the way that the symbol is made, the way that it's hammered. Um, and then I think the finish might have been the last one. But anyways, walk us through, oh, and then the profile the bell, how curved is the bow of the symbol, and how does that affect the sound. And it was really cool because as admittedly a not gear guy, I actually learned quite, quite a lot. Like for example, why specifically the monophonic ride uh, has such good stick definition, right? Because it's got that extra bowing. And when you do the extra bowing, it brings out a uh, higher pitch stick definition. It's like, oh my god, a beautiful jazz symbol. Now that makes a little more sense to me. Also very useful just for like thinking about and shopping for symbols online. Uh, YouTube videos have gotten way better in terms of showing you what symbols do. But it's really hard to gauge, especially like the volume of a symbol. Um, so after this talk, you, know, you feel a little bit better equipped to see a video and look at the details of a symbol. For example, the weight, the bowing, and have a better idea of like, what's that actually going to sound like in the room when I'm playing it here in my rehearsal space after spending you know, all my savings from the last six months on it. Um, so that was really cool. Gabriel knocked it out of the park, um, fielded some questions, um, and I'm actually doing a follow-up talk with him to answer the slew of questions we didn't have time for um, that we posted in the student group. Um, but that was really fun. And then the second, uh, the second guest speaker was another treat and something very different. He was Dr. Michael Shadlin, one of the world's foremost neuroscientists. So he is a researcher at Columbia. I heard about him, like I said, I, was, I did a psychology undergraduate degree. I didn't take any classes with him, I didn't study with him, but I sort of just found out about him while I was on campus. 
um, he's a professor at Columbia, and he's a lead researcher at uh, the Zuckerman Institute, which is Columbia's mind, brain, and behavior state-of-the-art research facility, where they do a lot of crazy things I don't understand. Um, but he, his work touches on a lot of different areas, but for our purposes, he, uh, at the level of the neuron, like at the, at, the, at the deepest level of the brain, he studies decision making and what goes into, uh, like, neurologically, uh, the making of even the simplest decision to move your eyes over there or to move your hand or to move at all. And that, you know, scales upward and he has thoughts on how that affects creativity and our perception of time and aesthetics. And to, to fully tie him into our circle, and the reason that I thought it would be cool for him to, to speak to us, is he's also a jazz guitarist. So he's deeply interested in the creative process and specifically the improvisational process. So his talk, needless to say, was extremely cool. I will not try to summarize uh, the points, but I will play a couple clips from the PowerPoint that he gave, which was really cool. Again, just like a 20 minute masterclass on what's your brain doing at the most fundamental level when you're making any decision, including the decisions we make on the drum set from sort of lower level decisions like just hitting the drum, sort of an automatic pilot, procedural memory, delivering a hit to the tom, to more conceptual thinking. An idea comes to you to switch to the ride instead of the hi-hat. Um, the same underlying process is, is, is behind both of those different level degrees of, uh, of decision making. It was really cool to just get his take. I mean, yeah, he's on a whole other level. Uh, but it was really interesting. So guest speaker number two, Michael Shadlin, was really cool. Um, and then to close it off, uh, I played a drum solo that uh, you know, was restricted to only vocabulary that we had, that had been in lessons and courses from this year. So again, celebrating the curriculum and, and the lessons from this year. So I played you know, fully improvised drum solo uh, using, I think there are six courses that have, uh, uh, yeah, six courses that have been entirely or mostly finished during 2022. So it's cool to improvise a little solo for everyone to close out the night. Um, and that was the Student Summit, an absolute blast and really a highlight in my teaching career so far. So I'm going to play a couple clips from the Summit now. Um, just so you can get a little bit, bit of an idea of what it was like. See you on the other side. And the award is a 14 by 6.5 uh, black nickel over brass pork pie snare drum. I would like to give it to Mr. Bo Kodik. A minor 19-inch polyphonic crash to Dylan Pinard. I want to give this next award um, to Mr. Danny Yost. Uh, who is right here. And it's going to be a minor 18-inch jazz medium thin crash. The first JP Pave Method t-shirt ever created. I'm literally only going to print three of these and send them to you. Um, and a brick of sticks of your choosing. I want to give this to Sent Hoy, Mr. Harry Sermon, Dave K. If it's not hitting that apex of volume fast enough, you will overplay that symbol. And I've seen guys break several of their heavier rot or heavier crashes because they're overplaying them because they want them to respond faster and sometimes just moving someone to a thinner crash will actually help them the reverse of that is that thinner crashes are going to respond faster but they don't have quite as much volume so sometimes guys will overplay thinner crashes because they're not getting enough, you know, feedback from the symbol. And so there's just a balance there that you have to find. And that's actually why we offer so many different weights, especially for crashes. This is a Byzance Foundry Reserve. And you can see there's a lot of craters from the hammer strikes, right? And even on the bell here. So the sound, the sound waves are traveling across the symbol back and forth. So if we could get this surface perfectly smooth, then the sound waves are going to, they're going to be smoother and they're going to be more consistent and they're going to be more uniform. But the more variations that we add to the surface, that's going to create 
more variation in the sound waves. And what that actually does is it kind of scatters them. They go in different directions. Uh, they go at different speeds. And that creates what we call a, a complex sound. I think that the, uh, the essence of, the, of, of, of artistic expression or the aesthetic in general is in time because all cultures have expectations about time. Whereas if even if we thought about um, harmony, we don't all share the same expectations about harmony and scaling, scales and things like that, okay? And so we certainly don't share the necessarily the same origin stories and things like that. So what we appeal to is a set of expectations and then things like question and answer, tension and release. So that's a Dave Lieben quote, quote. He says, uh, art is constant tension and release. And, that's, and that is where the artists live between the two or at times submerged in either. You can think about that for a while um, as you suspend the, the release uh, and, and just apply the tension. And um, I assume that you do this often when you, um, when you do this magical thing to me. It's like, you know, play three, o feel three over four and things like that. In some sense, there's some physical limitations, which is that, you know, your muscles don't even, don't even start to change till probably a tenth of a second after you've, a minimum, after you've in initiated um, your, you've made your commitment to do something. And that's just the change that gets the forces going. And by the time that gets transmitted to the movement of your stick or your arm or whatever it's gonna be, the whole, the whole thing, that's gonna be many more tenths of a second. And somehow intuitively, you don't think about that again. You think about that in terms of what you intend because you know where the stick's got to go and what kind of force you want to have on it. And you even probably know whether you want to do something that's going to be a little trilly at the end or two things at the end, you know, I mean, your rudiments again. So, so um, all of those things are happening in your overall plan and they're happening at multiple time scales. And with that, I'll give you a final thought, which is that, so we know and we perceive the world via interrogation. And interrogation is shaped by our competencies. And these, what I mean by that are the concepts we have, the knowledge we've already achieved, the vocabulary we have, like we're thinking about, about you know, discussing history, science, whatever, but also the vocabulary you have on your instrument, your rudiments and your repertoire. Blog 32, uh, J.P. Bouvet Method Student Summit. Pretty fun. Now, as I said, I want to briefly talk about other things that are part of this big milestone, specifically the development of the new website. And again, really going to try hard not to make this a sales pitch. I'm going to tell you why I'm excited about this, why it's a big deal in my teaching career, right? Because if we're thinking about the blog as documenting the development of these milestones, it's very clear at this point in my drumming life that I have a the performance, uh, sort of music industry side of my life, and the drum world education side of my life. And I think people would be surprised um, how little overlap there is between these. Right? There are, if you're a drum, if you're on YouTube, you're a total drum nerd, you have favorite drummers there, uh, it's very possible that the when you flip into music industry world and you go talk to even a fairly well-known guitarist who's out touring with people, and you say, oh, my favorite drummer is you know, XYZ, very likely they will have no idea who it is. Right? These are sort of separate spheres. Um, and I am trying to keep uh, an active foot in both worlds. Um, the degree to which I'm succeeding, I don't know. The degree to which it's balanced, hard to say. It, it definitely varies from period to period. But um, 
that is, you know, the reality of, of at least my drum life at the moment. Um, so the website is a big, a big half of my life, and it really represents more than anything the educational half of my life, which is why this launch and uh, the ability to to just do new things and better things with students online is a big deal for me. Um, so yes, we launched in March. Um, the things that are exciting about the new site is, first of all, it is organized in a way that makes sense. <laughs> uh, the old the old website was. Like we didn't, I didn't put enough forethought into how many lessons it would accumulate. And at some point, you just had like 400 lessons and zero organizational tools. You just dropped into an ocean, the center of an ocean of drum lessons, and very few ways of sifting through them, some basic categorization. But I'm honestly amazed anyone made any progress on the old website. Um, but you know, kudos to anyone who did because because people did and they wrote me and they're like, I learned all these things. Um, so that's amazing. Anyways, the new website is organized in courses with chapters, and you track your progress, and you mark things as finished. And all of those lessons have, you know, PDFs and you know, downloads, standard definition, high definition. This is all very exciting to me. And a couple of years ago, I also resolved to, for every lesson that it makes sense with, to have PDFs so that people are learning to read by accident. Right? They're always seeing the notation that represents the thing that they're playing. So even if they're playing by ear and just looking at the PDF, eventually those associations are going to get made, and they're going to start to develop, uh, yeah, by accident, again, uh, a pretty decent sense of what drum notation means on the drum set. So organizationally, very exciting. Major, major, major update. Um, the other biggest, the biggest thing, the other big thing that I'm really excited about is we launched these things called progress posts. Um, and when I say we, it's a me and my computer programmer, one of my oldest friend, Mike Linden, great guitar player, also a computer programmer. He's the only person, the other person on that is, helps with the site. Um, when we do a big update, uh, he's very generous with his time, and we work together at his place and launch the site. So it feels, it does feel weird saying I all the time, I do this, I do this. So I tend to say we, but it really is just me. <laughs> um, uh, I'm pretty much the only one involved with everything going on as far as like, the direction, filming the stuff, running the site on a daily basis, until something breaks and I need Mike to help me fix it or we're going to do an update. It's really just me. So um, we launched the ability, uh, these things called progress posts, which is at the end of every chapter, now that it's organized in chapters, students can submit uh, videos. Then the idea is, OK, use the content from this chapter and improvise a drum solo. Uh, or improvise or show me the exercises or do whatever you need to do. I try to encourage people to add a little bit of creativity to it so that I can see where you're at. And then I send a video back at my drum set giving feedback, uh, giving ideas, exercises, detours that aren't a part of the course that are specific to that student. This is incredibly cool for many ways, for many reasons. One, I get to know students playing actually fairly well. So I'm always encouraging people to submit them because after you submit a few, not only do I get to know you're playing, but I oftentimes start to get to know the student, right? Because we'll back and forth a little bit over email, or I'll include a little anecdote about a show you just played, and you were able to use whatever, the drone based content that we just learned. That's what's really cool. So I'm st I, that's why the Student Summit was so special, because I just spent a year getting to know these students, and their playing, and their struggles, and their victories, and what they're up to. Um, so just all the more cool. Um, the other nice thing about progress post is, is a way to track your own progress, right? You, these things stay on the website and you collect, obviously, my feedback as well. Um, and it's just a better way to learn, right? You're getting direct feedback about things you care about and I can see where the courses uh, have gaps along the way. Um, so this is just big. This is really big. Um, and that just takes the value of, not only the value of the website, but just the the it gives us the ability to actually form a mentor-student relationship um, in a way that is sustainable and really effective so far. So you know that's where we talk about. I give people feedback on their technique. I was just giving somebody progress post feedback yesterday on their left hand technique while we we're doing all these fills. Not something that's touched on in the course, but something that this student needs to bring a little bit of attention to. That stuff's awesome. So progress posts are big, and then. The, there, are, there are some other things that are exciting about the new site, but the other thing that is probably most exciting and that is, again, in the, in the spirit of uh, milestones in my educational career, 
uh, is that RhythmBot is integrated into the website where it makes sense. And I guess at some point there could have been a blog about RhythmBot, but again, very boring. Phone calls, typing on WhatsApp to Jamie, and looking at my computer. <laughs> but RhythmBot is a web app that I made with uh, a student, a longtime student, Jamie Howard, who is a computer programmer. He actually deserves most of the credit because um, he did most of the work. And he actually came to me and was like, look what I made. <laughs> I made this thing based on your concepts. Um, so he's really a total G in that regard. And we have big dreams and hopes for RhythmBot, and maybe it will be very updated in the future when you're watching this blog. But at the moment, it's a web app, which means you go to your web browser and type in rhythmbot.app, and it comes up. And it ran it's a melody, it's a rhythm randomizer. It, it is the best tool on earth for teaching you to read music and teaching you to improvise and expand your rhythmic vocabulary by giving you a constant supply of flashcards of varied and randomized rhythms according to the levels, the parameters you set, you know, triplet, straight time, whatever. Um, very cool. That's integrated into the site where it makes sense. So if you are, for example, um, triplet fills and chops course, uh, you're doing something like the swung down up, which is a way of thinking of melodies on the drum set that you can play basically infinite drum fills with. After I explain how that goes, there's a, oh, there's a rhythm bot link. And it takes you to rhythm bot, and there's a custom uh, thing. There's a custom like uh, preset that gives you infinite examples of what you just worked on so that instead of me giving you a PDF with 85 <laughs> you know, variations, this gives you infinite variations. And it's nice because then you can't accidentally just be memorizing things. When you have like, okay, I have 10 examples. Yeah, I'm pretending that I haven't seen them before, but my body actually knows what they sound like, knows what they feel like to play, and that's not challenging me anymore. So this gives you infinite variety, and that's really exciting. Um, so anyways, there's probably some other stuff about the site that is equally exciting that I'm forgetting. But these are the big things that stand out to me as like, OK, JP Bouvet Method has taken an enormous leap forward in a way that is that has for the last, however many months, seven months that it's been, I don't know, 10 months that it's been, um, that has really changed my teaching career in a significant way. And I have to say, to be totally honest, has really reignited to the highest degree yet um, my passion and excitement for doing this. Because the website now, the structure, the framework is there to make this uh, a really complete drum academy. And that's exactly what I'm working toward. Um, and it's working. And students are, are thriving like I've never seen them thrive before. And it's to a large degree thanks to these features that I just described. So that's exciting. Anyways, the third thing that I said I would mention, let me make sure my camera doesn't die, um, is I went back to school. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I don't think it will be particularly interesting to most people. But for those who are interested, um, I actually went back to school uh, a year before COVID happened. Um, and then COVID hit. And then I had to do a year of Zoom school. And then I was in person school. And it was like regular university school. Um, it's amazing how you change even after, you know, over just a few years. I, I, I tend to think every three years I'm a different person. Um, all I wanted to do was explore something different and think about something other than the drums. And I wanted a classic academic experience. Um, and I never had that because I did sort of band camp university by going to music college which is exactly what I should have been doing at that point. You couldn't have made me give half a shit about philosophy course or history course um, when I was 19 years old. Um, that is just the reality of where I was at then and what I was focused on. And that was see, perfect. Yeah, no regrets. That's exactly where I should have been. As a now 32-year-old and as a 28-year-old when I was going back to school, I was just in such a different place. Like I was so hungry to learn things that weren't uh, drum related. Um, and it's like for years, there, there was a long build up to it. You know, for years I had been, I had been uh, reading a lot of books about or studying in general, mindfulness, meditation, uh, psychology, and well-being. I sort of realized one day that a lot of the books I read were written by psychologists or neuroscientists. And that was like a, 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 
a cue a sen- in a sense. I, had, I had realized, like, oh, this is sort of a side passion that, or an interest, a sustained interest that I haven't really acknowledged. Um, and then I started thinking about, like, I'd like to just push myself in a new direction, try something different, see what's out there. And it was an itch that be- it became clear that I needed to scratch it at some point. Um, you know, I, I've said this many times in different places, but when something is tempting you for years, at some point you, you have to act on it, if not just to lay it to rest. Right? You might get into it and be like, yeah, it sucked. I'm not into it. But then at least you can move forward and it, you can like uh, free up that mental space. Hold on. So it's not constantly tempting you. But anyways, that sort of happened. Big build up. And it was actually on a bike trip in Iceland. We did like a, we biked like 500 miles around the ring road of Iceland um, for three weeks on a bike tour where you pack up your, you know, your tent, your food, everything on a bicycle, a touring bicycle, and you bike all day. And then you camp at night. And it was uh, among the most incredible experiences of my life. Iceland is a very beautiful place, very challenging climate. Um, in classic me form, uh, that's like a notoriously difficult route. And I had never biked to it before. But a friend of mine and his wife were trying to get some people together. And I'm kind of down for whatever. So if someone's going to organize it and it's an adventure, sign me up. I'm in decent shape. Um, and it was awesome. But anyways, it was on that trip that uh, so far away from drums. Right? The very thought of being a drummer was so weird and abstract to me. I was like, I can't believe that I'm going to go back home I'm out in like the wild, um, surviving. And I'm going to go back home and like practice the drums every day. Like the fact that I was a drummer became so strange and weird to me. Um, and just felt like, okay, I need to explore something else about the world, something else about life, about career, expand my, my not only my, my own uh, like interest, curiosities, information, but also just my circle, right? There's people out there that I just don't know. I'm always in music world. Um, and there was a tipping point. Anyways, threw a bunch of applications around. Miraculously, by sheer miracle, got into Columbia University. Don't know how. Guess I wrote a good essay. Um, fooled again. But uh, they let me in, and I didn't take that for granted for a second. Um, so I spent three years, again, getting an undergraduate degree in psychology, but at every chance studying, uh, you know, aside from the psych classes that were required had a lot of uh, electives and core curriculum type of stuff that's required at the school. I had dropped out of Berkeley after two years, which is why it was an undergrad degree. I can't get a master's yet. Um, and honestly, it was perfect. It was great. So I had some transfer credit. So it took me three years part-time, doing about 75% time, three classes, uh, to finish a psychology degree. And again, I spent three years commuting to school, studying reading, sitting, typing papers. Um, And it was honestly one of the, it was among the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Um, Why? Uh, I needed it. I needed to expand my intellectual horizons. I needed to just be introduced to a lot of things. It did for me what a classical education is supposed to do. Right, philosophy courses, history courses, you know, economics, like all sorts, the whole, like all the fields, a little, a little dip in, a little survey of what's out there, history of Western literature. Um, and it just sort of, sort of like showed me like all this stuff's out here and here's a, a crash course on a lot of it, some basic ways to approach it, some eras, some ways to think about it. And I sort of left school or would leave each semester with new interests and with, yes, like some you know, uh, specific information I had learned about things, but more importantly, just an expanded uh, understanding of what's even out there. Um, and as school has ended, like, it's been really rewarding to just carry that with me forward and know where I have interests, and know where I don't have as much interest, and so forth. Start to just, like, see, to be able to dive deeper into stuff for my own personal just well-being and interest. Um, and yeah, so it was wonderful. I, ma- I made some friends, right? To, to leave music and art world and, and be around a different community of people was really rewarding in a couple ways. One, I made some great friends who are just different and I've always felt like a little bit of an outsider in music world because I'm, I'm not as obsessed with music as a lot of other people around me are. Um, and it's really nice to have some friends that are on both sides of that now. 
uh, on, the, on the inverse of that, in a way, uh, it sounds sort of contradictory, but it's not. I, I, I became more appreciative than ever of the music community friends I have. Um, right when you're, you know, you can't describe water to a fish. Right when you're in something, it's difficult to have any perspective on it. And I do feel like the art and the music community that I'm in is really special. I think people, they are just more curious emotionally and in tune emotionally, and they, they I'm making broad brush jokes, but they care a little bit more deeply. Right? They look you deep in the eye, and they'll really want to know how you're doing today, and they'll want to talk about it, you know? They'll want to plunge into those, you know, uh, emotions and hear about it. Um, and that's not always the case with, with everyone, but I feel like uh, uh, in the music art world, that is especially common. And I became more grateful than ever for that because it's really nice. Um, so yeah. Uh, but anyways, questions that will certainly come up because I get asked them all the time, uh, what am I doing with it? Am I going to become a psychologist? Am I going to do a master's? Am I going to go into grad school in any way? Um, does this interface with my drumming or my teaching in any way? Uh, short answers to all those because I don't, I don't have firm answers on many of them. I'm definitely not going on to grad school anytime soon. Uh, this is actually, if anything, those three years when I came back in the music world, I've never felt more excited to be in music world, to be teaching, to be running the website. I have all these new musical projects coming out that I'm super excited about. Childish James has a new album that is super exciting. And now I have the time to dedicate to all of it since I graduated school in May. Um, so I, everything was on the back burner, basically. I was just kind of keeping things going, uh, you know, uh, as best I could. But now, full steam ahead, and it feels so good to be fresh uh, on the drums and to know this is where I need to be right now. Um, so not doing anything right now. Will I become a psychologist one day when I'm 50? I don't know. Maybe. The door's open. I'm still very interested in, in well-being and spirituality and psychology of belief, religion, politics, all these things. Um, but we'll see. Right now, I'm not thinking too hard about it. Does it interface with my teaching? I actually, when I went back to school, I was pretty adamant on keeping music and psych separate because every you know, immediately it became clear that like as soon as I told people I played the drums, they're like, "So you're going to do like psychology and music? So you're going to like study this and combine them?" And like I was like, "I don't think that's not actually why I'm here. Like I'm actually just interested in the psych by itself." Um, so I kept them kind of separate, but towards the end, there's just so much obvious overlap uh, when you're learning about whatever memory, different types of memory looking at your drums and you're trying to learn something and memorize something, you're like, well, I guess it's kind of relevant. So stuff is relevant. Um, and I do think it has, in, in certain ways, made me a better teacher, but not in the ways you'd think. Right? I don't think there are, I mean, the things I learned about the brain, for example, uh, or about the mind, about psychology, those aren't in a major way informing my teaching. But I do feel like in a very ambiguous way, and I think some people will uh, associate with this or relate to this who went back to school as an older person I feel like I'm just thinking better um, and in a very broad and vague way um, where like I don't know in school you, I was just asked to think harder about things and make longer more complicated arguments and reason things out very carefully and sometimes reason things out in ways that I wouldn't have naturally done it and I found in a very diffuse way, I was just having better ideas and thinking better outside of school, too. So when I would think about my curriculum, I would have sort of light bulb moments where things were either like, I would realize that there was an underlying philosophy like governing my decisions. Or I would realize that there was sort of a structure that I hadn't uh, uh, noticed before that connected all of these previously disparate teaching ideas. Um, so in a way, it affected me in a very diffuse way that I'm very grateful for and that I hope lasts. I guess we'll see. I don't want to have to go back to school every five years to keep having good drum ideas. But um, so that was very interesting. And, and you know, I think I think that's I think that's all we need to say about it for now. It was a big it was a huge thing in my personal life. It's uh, minimally relevant to the drums at the moment, uh, but uh, nonetheless, you know, the, I try to include a little bit about regular life, private life, in the blog as well, because 
it's just important stuff, and uh, it's fun to share with you guys. I know you you are with me, and some of you are on similar journeys. I know certain students of mine, even now on the website, are university level pro professors of various things, usually related to music. Um, some have gone back to school for other things. Some have jobs as engineers or whatever else. Um, so I know there's a huge variety of, uh, of lives and interests out there on the other side of this camera. And uh, it's cool to, to just create or, or, or reveal a few more different ways that we're all the same and we're all connected. So anyways, school was a big deal. And to tie it all back together, that's how I found out about Dr. Michael Shadlin. And that's why I invited him to the Student Summit, the J.P. Vivay Method Inaugural Student Summit. And that, folks, is blog number 32. You can expect a fewer and smaller gaps between this blog and the coming ones because we're back on the saddle. All right. Hope you're having a good day. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon. Later.